Welcome to Bedtime Stories for Night Owls. Tonight's story is The Magic Shop by H.G. Wells. I had seen the magic shop from afar several times. I'd passed it once or twice, a shop window of alluring little objects, magic balls, magic hens, wonderful cones, ventriloquist dolls, the material of the basket trick, packs of cards that looked all right, and all that sort of thing. But never had I thought of going in until one day, almost without warning, Git hauled me by my finger right up to the window and so conducted himself that there was nothing for it but to take him in. I had not thought the place was there, to tell the truth, a modest-sized frontage in Regent Street, between the picture shop and the place where the chicks run about just out of the patent incubators. But there it was, sure enough. I'd fancied it was down near the circus, or around the corner in Oxford Street, or even in Holborn. Always over the way and a little inaccessible it had been, with something of the mirage in its position. But here it was, now quite indisputedly, and the fat end of Gip's pointing figure made a noise upon the glass. If I was rich, said Gip, dabbing a finger at the disappearing egg, I'd buy myself that, and that, which was the crying baby, very human, and that, which was a mystery, and called, so a neat card asserted, buy one and astonish your friends. Anything, said Gip, will disappear under one of those cones. I've read about it in a book. And there, Dada, is the vanishing halfpenny. Only they've put it this way up, so we can't see how it's done. Gip, dear boy, inherits his mother's breeding, and he did not propose to enter the shop or worry in any way. Only, you know, quite unconsciously, he lugged my finger downward, and he made his interest clear. That, he said, and pointed to the magic bottle. If you had that, I said, at which promising inquiry he looked up with a sudden radiance. I could show it to Jessie, he said, thoughtful as ever of authors. It's less than a hundred days to your birthday, Gibbles, I said, and laid my hand on the door handle. Gip made no answer, but his grip tightened on my finger, and so we came into the shop. It was no common shop, this. It was a magic shop, and all the prancing prece precedence Gip would have taken in the matter of mere toys was wanting. He left the burthen of the conversation to me. It was a little narrow shop, not very well lit, and the doorbell pinged again with a plaintive note as we closed it behind us. For a moment or so, as we were alone and could glance about us, there was a tiger in paper mache on the glass case that covered the low counter, a grave, kind-eyed tiger that waggled his head in a methodical manner. There were several crystal spheres, a china hand holding magic cards, a stock of magic fish bowls in various sizes, and an immodest magic hat that shamelessly displayed its springs. On the floor were magic mirrors, one to draw you out long and thin, one to swell your head and banish your legs, and one to make you short and fat like a draft. And while we were laughing at these, the shopman, as I suppose, came in. At any rate, there he was behind the counter, a curious, sallow, dark man, with one ear larger than the other, and a chin like the toe cap of a boot. What can we have the pleasure, he said, spreading his long magic fingers on the glass case. And so with a start, we were aware of him. I want, I said, to buy my little boy a few simple tricks. Leisure domain, he asked. Mechanical? Domestic? Anything amusing, said I. Um, said the shopman, and scratched his head for a moment as if thinking. Then, quite distinctly, 
he drew from his head a glass ball. Something in this way, he said, and held it out. The action was unexpected. I'd seen the trick done at entertainments endless times before. It's part of the common trick of conjurers, but I'd not accept, expected it here. That's good, I said with a laugh. Isn't it, said the shopman. Gip stretched out his disengaged hand to take this object and found merely a blank palm. It's in your pocket, said the shopman, and there it was. How much will that be, I asked. We make no charge for glass balls, said the shopman politely. We get them, he picked one out of his elbow as he spoke, free. He produced another from the back of his neck and laid it beside its predecessor on the counter. Gip regarded his glass ball sagely, then directed a look of inquiry at the two on the counter, and finally brought his round-eyed scrutiny to the shopman, who smiled. You may have those, too, said the shopman, and if you don't mind, one from my mouth. So, Gip counseled me mutely for a moment, and then in a profound silence, put away the four balls, resumed my reassuring finger, and nerved himself for the next event. We get all our smaller tricks in that way, the shopman remarked. I laughed in the manner of one who subscribes to a jest. <laughs> Instead of going to the wholesale shop, I said, of course, it's cheaper. In a way, the shopman said, though we pay in the end, but not so heavily as people suppose. Our larger tricks and our daily provisions and all the other things we want, we get out of that hat. And you know, sir, if you'll excuse me saying it, there isn't a wholesale, wholesale shop, not for genuine magic goods, sir. I don't know if you noticed our inscription, the genuine magic shop. He drew a business card from his cheek and handed it to me. Genuine, he said, and his finger on the word and added, there is absolutely no deception, sir. He seemed to be carrying out the joke pretty thoroughly, I thought. He turned to Gip with a smile of remarkable affability. You, you know, are the right sort of boy. I was surprised at his knowing that because in the interests of discipline, we keep it rather a secret even at home. But Gip received it in an unflinching silence, keeping a steadfast eye on him. It's only the right sort of boy gets through that doorway. And as if by way of illustration, there came a rattling at the door and a squeaking little voice could be faintly heard. Yar. I wanna go in there, Dada. I wanna go in there, yeah. And then the accents of a downtrodden parent, urging consolations and propit propitiations. It's locked, Edward, he said. But it isn't, said I. It is, sir, said the shopman, always, for that sort of child. And as he spoke, we had a glimpse of the other youngster's small white face, pallid from sweet eating and over food and distorted by evil passions, a ruthless little egotist pawing at the enchanted pain. It's no good, sir, said the shopman, as I moved with my natural helpfulness doorward, and presently the spoilt child was carried off howling. How do you manage that, I said, breathing more freely. Magic, said the shopman with a careless wave of the hand, and behold, sparks of colored fire flew out of his fingers and vanished into the shadows of the shop. 